She was a lecturer for almost 10 years in soil science uh, for Melbourne University at Dukey College. Prior to lecturing at Dukey, um, Kath worked for the Department of Agriculture in extension programs focused around soil health. Kath has a Bachelor and Masters of Science in Agriculture from the University of Sydney and a Graduate Certificate in Soil Conservation from the University of Adelaide. She's a, an accredited, oh, she's accredited by Soil Science Australia as a certified professional soil scientist. I challenge you all to say that. Um, she also holds a certificate for in training and assessment. Um, Kath now works as a consultant delivering soil health training programs and works with farmers and industry groups, farming and industry groups, as well as individuals um, to help clients understand their soils better and um, develop uh, management decisions. Kath, together with um, local editor Judy Brooks from Yay River Catchment Land Care, published the Understanding Your Soil Test Step-by-Step booklet as a guide to assist farmers and land managers um, year in, year out. Um, that's a hint to understand um, soil tests and support key farm decisions. So this present, these presentations have been based around that booklet. Hopefully you've got a hard copy, it's available online. Um, and if you're wanting to look anything up from the sessions, um, we invite you to um, have a look through the book. Um, because it's um, directly relevant and also that booklet, um, you know, each year or a couple of years when you're undertaking your soil testing and you're, you know, trying to remember again that critical element or how to compare something, um, you can pull the book off the bookshelf and um, just remind yourself of some of those, um, some of those things because it is a complex um, in a complex thing. Uh, well, at least I find uh, it is complex and interesting. Um, I've just got a couple of um, other people joining us. Um, Neil from Benella oh, and Karen's uh, Alfred. Uh, Alfred, the red dot just means that you're busy in a meeting at the moment. So um, don't worry too much about that. And um, thank you. And I'll hand over to you now. Thanks, Kath. There we go. There we go. Thanks, okay. Rhiannon. You can see that. Um, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Oh, yes, it's still there. So someone might need to mute. Um, thanks, Rhiannon. And uh, look, lovely to um, have you all uh, rejoining us uh, again. Great to see that I haven't frightened you all off, and you've you've come back. Um, so. The three sessions um, have been about how to read your soil test and understanding some of the critical limits or target values that you might need to think about. Just to understand a little bit um, how um, people develop recommendations that they might be recommending for you and giving you some thoughts and considerations about how you might evaluate those recommendations or just how you might discuss those with your advisor or whoever has given you the recommendations. So the idea here is not necessarily to make you an expert, but just to help you be more on a level footing with your advisor in your discussions around your soil health management plan. Uh, and so the key messages really are that um, soil tests are really only one piece of the puzzle. They're not 100% of the story. And I think you would have seen from last week, particularly when we started to talk about things like phosphorus um, and some of the other major nutrients, that your goals are a really important component of the decision making. So how, what your goals are for your property uh, but also the paddock condition and soil type are all important considerations. So we don't just see a number on the soil test, look up a critical figure or a critical limit and then make a decision. Uh, it's important that you consider all those components in your decision making. Um, and soil testing so then is a very important tool for, for you as someone who is managing the soil health of your property. Uh, 
and as such a regular sampling regime um, is what we really need. So try to interpret a one-off soil test is quite difficult, uh, but where you've had a regular sampling regime, then um, it helps us all to understand a bit more about what's going on and gives us all a bit more confidence. Um, the last uh, two sessions, we've talked about um, some of these terms that are often used, available and extractable and total and exchangeable. Um, and I've been showing you this uh, diagram just to give you a sense of the complexity of what's happening in soils, as uh, Rhiannon has rightly pointed out, it's quite a um, complex series of nutrient pools and pathways. Uh, and nutrients do exist in the mineral phase and also in the organic phase, uh, and plant roots are taking them up through the soil solution. So how nutrients get into that soil solution um, is governed by a number of things. One of them is the chemistry and the other is the soil biology. Uh, so today I want to, uh, we're going to particularly cover um, this part here, this exchangeable pool. We're going to talk about cation exchange capacity and exchangeable cations. And we're also going to touch on uh, trace elements. And then towards the end, I'm going to pick up on some questions that we didn't quite get to last week. There were some homework questions and some more questions that have come through. Um, so I'll answer those and then we'll open it up uh, for general questions um, and we can have some discussion around those. So kicking off then, uh, cation exchange uh, capacity. Uh, what is it? So it's the, uh, the capacity of the soil to hold on to uh, cations. So in soils uh, on, that, on the mineral surfaces and also in, in the organic matter, there are a number of negative uh, charges or negative surface char on the surface of those um, of the minerals and of the organic matter. And cations are positively charged ions. Uh, and in soil, the ones that we commonly talk about are calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, hydrogen, and aluminium. Um, and so we, what we know is that a when a positive charge comes close to a negative charge, they attract. So those things attract and stick on. So in this way, uh, soil is able to hold on to nutrients. Uh, so those cations are held on uh, into the soil and uh, are less vulnerable to, to leaching. So it's one of the fundamental properties of soil in that it is a key indicator of uh, soil's overall fertility status. Uh, so um, on page 10 of the book, we've, we've got some notes in there around cation exchange uh, capacity, and you may in, on your soil test have a cation exchange capacity number. Often the way they measure it is by measuring all of these, uh, all of the cations that we've just talked about and add them up as a sum of cations. And that then is, they, they are saying is, uh, you know, around about equivalent to your cation exchange capacity. Just one more note. I know uh, Neil sent through some questions around cation exchange capacity. Um, Generally, organic matter uh, has a very high cation exchange capacity, uh, so it will be above um, 200 uh, centimoles of positive charge per kilogram. Uh, and clays are the other source of cation exchange capacity. Uh, in clays, um, they might go from around 10 up to 150, and there are differences in the types of clay. 
Uh, so Neil, I'm not going to go into too much detail um, today because it's probably a little bit too much for everyone. But suffice to say that there are um, some clays like smectites that have a much higher range of cation exchange. Uh, these are clays that are formed more in the lower uh, parts of the of the landscape, in the depression and so on. Um, and some of these smectites have a shrink swell characteristic. So those of you that are observing uh, cracking in your soil, so cracking clays, that's a sure sign that you've got some smectite clays and in general, they are, um, have a very high cation exchange capacity. So more than 60 or 80 uh, centimoles of positive charge per kilogram. Going down to quite low kaolins, um, around 10 to 15, um, these clays are more often found up in the north of Australia um, in more dominant weathering uh, conditions. However, Suffice to say that here in uh, North East Victoria, some really interesting work has been done that shows that some of our clay types have actually been blown in from uh, the northern and central parts of Australia. Uh, so we do have some kaolin appearing in some of our clays, as well as a mix of micas and smectites. So that's probably enough on clay mineralogy for enough for everyone probably. So we'll move on and we'll go to having a look at uh, the exchangeable uh, cations. Now I've just realised I haven't put a page number. This is on page 32, sorry, of your, of your booklets. So as I said, the cations are positively charged uh, ions and the ones that we particularly take note of are calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, aluminium and also hydrogen. Uh, so there's a range of methods that are used in the laboratories to measure these. Uh, most commonly, it's an ammonium acetate method. So you, you mix your soil with something that's going to um, be very attractive to these cations and they get pulled off the, um, the clays and the organic matter. And then you can measure um, how much you picked up uh, in the on the ammonium acetate uh, solution. Uh, they are reported as centimoles of positive charge per kilogram. That is the more modern measure, uh, but some of you may have on your soil test a unit called milli equivalents per 100 grams. Um, so that's a, a bit of an older measure. The, the reason why we use or measure cation, uh, exchangeable cations is really to look ratio, at the ratios and the important ratios that we look at are the exchangeable sodium percentage, calcium magnesium ratio and aluminium percentage. So we'll just go and have a look at those uh, now. So in terms of calcium and uh, magnesium, uh, they're both uh, important for plants and plant growth. Calcium is usually the most dominant cation uh, in the soil. Um, and what we look at in the ratio is for uh, calcium magnesium ratios to be greater than two. Uh, on the slide there, you can see that if uh, the calcium magnesium ratio is less than two, that is um, what we like to see is calcium being more than twice the amount of magnesium, but where that's not the case, it can indicate that you've got poor soil structure. So this could lead to things like crusting and hard setting where your calcium magnesium ratio is less than um, two. I probably should also make the comment um, that uh, our calcium, our, our cation ratios in Australia uh, are quite different from Northern Hemisphere. So for those of you that have taken an interest uh, in Googling and finding uh, soil information from overseas, you just need to be aware that in Australia, our soils are more highly weathered. And so our cations, uh, 
the amounts and their ratios are quite different because we've got a lot more weathered uh, soil. Uh, and sodium, uh, the exchangeable sodium percentage. Um, so what we're looking for is uh, if your sodium exchange, your exchangeable sodium percentage is more than 6%. So what that means is that more than 6% of those negative surface charges have, um, have attracted in a sodium. So there's more sodium than 6% on those exchangeable uh, sites. It, it uh, indicates a tendency of the soil to uh, disperse. Uh, and you can see there on the slide that that is quite different to uh, what is quoted in America, where they look at um, dis soils that might disperse once ESP is more than 15%, so a lot bigger. Uh, and that's because our soils spent a lot more of their time exposed to the elements, while Northern Hemisphere soils had been covered with um, ice. So what do I mean by dispersion? So over here, I've got quite a simple little experiment that you can do yourself. Um, we've just got a, an aggregate or a ped, so one of those crumbly bits of soil, and dropped it into a clear jar or saucer of rainwater um, or distilled water. And just watch what happens over a 24 hour period. See in, in this dish here, um, we've plopped the aggregate in and nothing has happened. It's just remained quite stable. In this um, Petri dish here, we've dropped the two aggregates in and they've crumbled or collapsed and that's called slaking. And in this Petri dish, we've dropped the, oh, sorry. We've dropped the aggregates in um, and you can see that over a 24 hour period, the water immediately around the aggregates have, has gone very uh, milky, very opaque, um, and that's clay floating about in that water. And this is what we mean by dispersion. So what's, what's the impact of that? Well, you can imagine if you um, have soils that um, are getting wet from, from rain, and this is what they do when they get wet, then all of that clay begins to clog up any pores uh, that water might be able to drain through. And so you tend to get uh, an exacerbation of waterlogging and then when the soil dries out, you get very hard or crusting occurring in the soil. So dispersion then is, uh, is quite an issue. Coming back to this Petri dish here where it's slaked, this is an indication that the organic matter levels in your soil are probably quite low. So that's meaning that the aggregates are not stable. Whereas in this dish here, we've plopped the aggregates in and the organic matter that is wrapping around those aggregates, much like a, um, a ball of wool. So that's the fine roots and the fungal hyphae and the bacterial exudates that stick soil together into these crumbly bits. It's quite strong. So even though the soil is wet, the um, the pores and in particular the macro, the large size pores all remain open so the soil can then be very well drained. Interestingly, um, this is taken from soils um, from my time at, at Dukey College uh, here. And this is the soils from the same profile. This is in the surface soil. This is um, going a bit further down the profile and this is deep into the subsoil. And this is a very common pattern uh, where you have dispersive subsoils. And we've talked about before about, you know, 
what's the role of ripping, deep ripping, um, aeration and so on. And what I've been saying is you just need to be careful about what the condition of your subsoil and this is what I'm talking about. Because you can imagine if you deep rip and you've got this kind of subsoil and you start bringing that up into the topsoil, um, then as many people have reflected to me, uh, the after deep ripping, they've ended up in a worse mess than where they were before. So it's not to say that I'm not a fan of deep ripping. If you if you are deep ripping uh, and your where your soil is not dispersive, so it doesn't go like this. Um, then it can be a really good thing in soils. But you just need to be careful uh, if you are considering that kind of action. Um, and the last one we wanted to talk about was exchangeable aluminium, which we've touched on a little bit uh, in our previous session around soil acidity. So what we talked about was that aluminium becomes more available uh, as pH declines. Uh, and that's because um, aluminium is a major component of soil minerals. So it's it, it clay minerals, it's in the clay. And as the pH drops, then more of that aluminium comes out of the clay mineral and sits on the clay surface and becomes exchangeable. So what we're looking for uh, the critical limit is is five percent. Uh, so if your aluminium is more than five percent as exchangeable aluminium, uh, then you've got reasonably high levels, and you may need to do something about it. Uh, we also know that there are plants that differ in their tolerance. So if you are considering lucerne, then your um, critical le levels are even lower. There are other ways of measuring um, aluminium. So some of you may have aluminium as measured in calcium chloride. And what we're looking for is aluminium that's less than two. So we want it to be less than two. If it's more than two, um, then you may uh, be in strife. And, and what's happening to the plant is that it really affects root growth. So you can see here in this diagram, um, on Phalaris, what it's doing to root growth. It also interferes with, this, with the plant's ability to uptake uh, water and nutrient. So altogether, um, it has a big impact on productivity. So what are some of the management options uh, <clears throat> if you have these issues? If your soil is dispersive, um, that is your cation exchange, uh, your L, your sorry, your so, your sodium levels are more than six percent, and or your calcium magnesium ratio is less than two, then you may want to consider gypsum. So gypsum is calcium sulfate, and it supplies um, calcium into the system, and it it will exchange some of that sodium for calcium on the um, on the mineral surfaces and on the surface of uh, organic matter. And so it boosts that level of calcium and reduces your uh, ESP and increases your calcium magnesium ratio. You can also uh, increase your organic matter inputs. So we saw uh, if you have slaking soils, soils that are collapsing when they're getting wet, they're not dispersing, but they're collapsing, then that's a sure sign you need to increase your organic matter um, levels. So to do that, you're really encouraged to make sure you keep your soil covered um, and practice some rotational grazing to really encourage root growth uh, down into that soil and that will increase your organic matter inputs into the soil. <clears throat> As I said, being cautious about um, deep ripping. And the other thing you may need to be careful about is your is your liming. If you are considering lime, um, being a bit more careful about the lime type. So just being aware that 
um, dolomite types of lime or, or, or dolomite itself uh, can have higher levels of magnesium in in the um, in the compound. So if you already have a low calcium magnesium ratio and you add dolomite, you're adding magnesium in and you'll make that calcium magnesium ratio even worse. So that's where you will you can run into problems with soil structure. So hard setting, crusting uh, and potentially some waterlogging uh, when the soil gets wet. So uh, Rhiannon, I'm thinking I might just pause there and um, just check <clears throat> to see if there are any questions, uh, if people have any concerns about their ESP, um, cation, uh, their calcium magnesium ratio uh, or their aluminium percentage. Uh, yeah, we've got a couple of questions, Kath. So Judy has asked, um, she, her CEC is written ECEC, so it's the effective CEC, sum of base and acidic cations and a more accurate indication of CEC. Um, but Judy's question is, um, her soil test is showing high organic carbon. So how or why is the ECEC or the CEC low to just acceptable in centimoles per kilo? Okay, so first of all, just the comment on the um, effective CEC. Um, so as I said, um, when we we're talking about cation exchange capacity and how it's measured in soils, a lot of the times they don't uh, measure the actual cation exchange capacity. Um, they measure it by measuring your adding up the number, the measure of cations plus hydrogen plus aluminium, and that gives you an effective cation exchange capacity. So um, it, it may sort of slightly underestimate a little bit, but but just I, I only slightly underestimate your cation exchange capacity. Um, so the other part of the question is why would you have it low when you, why would that be only low or moderate if you have a high level of organic matter in the soil? Um, yeah, hard one to answer. Um, it, it could be that, um, you know, effectively your soil uh, in that area may be sandy or doesn't have much clay or the clay type uh, is quite a low cation exchange and so you are reliant only on your organic matter. And if that organic matter um, content is mostly up in the upper part of the soil in your 0 to 10 centimetre soil sample, um, yeah, maybe it's diluting your cation exchange capacity out a bit. So I, I don't have a, I don't have a major, uh, I don't have a, you know, exact answer to your question. It is a little bit curious uh, and maybe it is something that you would take a look at next time you sample Judy to see whether that situation has been maintained. If you're striving to increase organic matter, um, maybe the next soil sample you take in a year or two's time or three years time, uh, you may start to see an increase in that cation exchange capacity. Thanks, Kath. Um, Judy, do you want to let us know um, that answers your question? And um, Gray has asked a question via text. Um, he has dispersive soil, um, but the, the pH is 7.94 in water. Is it still okay to add gypsum? Um, yes, I, I would I would think so. So if this, I'm just curious as to whether, um, sorry, what was this person's name, Rhiannon? 
Uh, hang on, I'm getting confused. It's grey. Sorry, that's on the. Yeah, it's grey. Grey. So, um, is grey talking about it's dispersive because of the test that he's done, or is it dispersive because of the ESP and calcium magnesium ratio? Um, let me just see if I can get. Um, Gray, are you there? Can you pop your microphone on? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah yep. sorry. It's actually Grant. It was auto text that changed it to Gray. Oh, um, that's why I'm confused with the email and the text. I was, <laughs> I was just frantically, I was frantically texting you to change my name. Um, <laughs> it's, it's actually the, the, the soil test. So our, our, uh, our calcium magnesium ratio is 1.7 and the um, uh, exchangeable, where are we, the exchangeable sodium, uh, where is it? Uh, I've lost it now on the soil, so, but it was high as well. So um, oh, here we go, exchangeable sodium is 11. 11%, yeah. Yeah, I just wonder whether adding gypsum is going to, but the but, but pH is fairly high. I don't know whether that would cause problems. No, look, it shouldn't, Grant. Um, gypsum um, can do a bit of um, acidifying, just um, a little bit, but I think with um, the sort of levels that you, the gypsum that you may be applying, at those um, ESP and calcium magnesium ratio, um, you should be fine to add gypsum. I just wanted to say something though, um, in general too about gypsum is, I don't think gypsum should be used as a long-term strategy. Um, gypsum should be used tactically and, and, the reason, and the times where I think it can be used really usefully is when you are wanting to establish a crop or a pasture. Um, so it's really important, particularly in pastures where you are sowing fine seeds, that you have um, good aeration of that seed. So that's where gypsum can be really useful to get your pasture established. And then I would be encouraging you to really look at increasing organic matter through your grazing management. Uh, so that you're not in a situation where you keep having to apply gypsum. Thank you. No problems. Thanks, Kath. Um, Alfred has asked um, how, what about gypsum type? So industrial versus natural mineral? Yeah, so we were able to, we were used to being able to get uh, byproduct gypsum. So this was coming from the byproduct of the making of uh, superphosphates. Uh, the the byproduct was gypsum. Uh, but as I understand it, it's not really available anymore, and we do have to use natural, uh, naturally occurring gypsum. So uh, naturally occurring gypsum. I think I've got a slide on this coming up, actually. So we'll we can talk more about it there. But um, naturally occurring gypsum, of course, will then also have um, other things in it. So you do need to um, ask for a um, an analysis of of the gypsum that you're buying, so you know what's in it. Yeah. Thanks, Kath. And there's um, some matter around Judy's question. Um, Darren has uh, made a comment that CEC is a natural condition of the soil. It's not a desirable target, which is uh, falsely reported on some tests. The organic matter may be high, but has a small influence on overall CEC. Um, and Judy has noted that she's still confused. Um, due to having high organic carbon in all the tests. One thing that they don't have to work on increasing, um, all steep hill country, both sedimentary and granitic. So um, do we want to come back to that or, or should we, um, do you want to pop her mic on? I'll just say, uh, you know, a comment, a comment on the comment that that is very true, that it is an inherent quality of the soil um, and so sometimes, you know, the, with the soil test, 
um, interpretation that may be happening there of saying that it's low or medium. Um, there's not a lot, you know, it, it is it is what it is. Um, that That's what it is. And I guess I was also just thinking back through my answer, thinking if they have measured it through the effective um, cation exchange capacity, so that is just adding up your, your exchangeable cations and getting to a number there, then that might be why the organic matter is not fully reflected in your cation exchange capacity. Um, that would be my other thought there. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Kath. I hope that helps. Um, but I don't. I don't always have the answers. <laughs> I think sometimes too, is it a matter of understanding the scenario, other elements of maybe the soil test, and the the pasture or farm system type um, geography. Um, is that yeah where you are in the landscape, all that sort of stuff and management history and stuff that actually all comes into play. So it's, it's quite hard from a single um, point to interpret exactly what's going on. Exactly, Rhiannon. And, you know, that's why I was sort of saying it'd be interesting to see whether there, whether it does change over time, um, which would indicate that more of the organic matter is starting to have an impact on that cation exchange capacity. Um, but I think also it goes back to that those first few comments that the um, soil test is only one piece of the puzzle. You know, as you're saying, Rhiannon, and there's a whole lot of other things that go into um, how we make sense of the number. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, Kath. Um, and I guess the only other thing I would say to Judy is that it's not a biggie. It's not a it's not a major issue that you need to address or fix or anything like that. It is sort of, it is what it is kind of thing. All right, so was there anything else um, that I'm needed no, to sorry, be addressed? Sorry, that's all for those questions. So yeah, ready to move on. Okay. So we'll just uh, now touch on the issue of trace elements. So that's on page 41 of your booklets. Um, so these are the micronutrients, that is plants only require these in uh, small amounts. And the ones that we typically are looking at or concerned about are zinc, copper, boron, and molybdenum, of course, you know, there are some more, but these are probably the more commonly, common ones that we talk about. Overarchingly, I don't have a lot to say about this because soil tests are difficult to interpret. The reason is because of that first dot point, the plant really only requires these in small uh, amounts and you can get into all sorts of strife with um, trying to so-called fix uh, trace element uh, issues uh, because they are so much influenced uh, by soil chemistry and soil pH. So by fixing one, um, you can induce a toxicity or a deficiency in another. So it's a very finely uh, balanced system in the trace element world. Uh, so I get a bit nervous about um, people interpreting trace elements and saying you need to put this on and that on. You have to be quite careful about this. So in some ways, you're uh, doing leaf analysis is pro possibly a better predictor of um, plant performance. And if your concern is more about the impacts on stock health, then potentially uh, looking into licks and supplements for your stock might be <coughs> a better way um, of fixing the issue than trying to um, 
apply something that is required in a very small amount, how do you apply that evenly across the soil is um, quite a difficult task. <clears throat> the other thing is that availability can also change with soil depth. So where, you know, we're, as we've been talking about, we're only looking at a 0 to 10 centimetre sample um, and the trace element situation can change from being um, slightly deficient in the topsoil to being uh, toxic in the subsoil, for example. Um, so um, it's not a clear cut story, just trying to interpret from your soil test. Uh, so again, the leaf analysis might be the better way to go. The only one that I was going to comment on <coughs> is molybdenum, mainly because uh, it is of most concern in the golden broken catchment. Um, its deficiency is very much linked with acid soils and it will affect your um, clover growth. And it is relatively easily fixed um, because there are quite a few fertilisers that you can buy that have uh, a molybdenum uh, fortified. So that's um, one way that you can go with molybdenum, but also by fixing your pH, um, you can also um, fix up the molybdenum availability issue. In a similar way, um, if you are further west in, in Western Victoria, uh, where the soils are a lot more alkaline, then you can be running into zinc deficiencies. And uh, again, you know, there are zinc fortified fertilizers available um, to try and fix that situation as well. <clears throat> so, um, I guess I didn't really want to say too much more about trace elements, but I will just check uh, if there's a if there is a question there. I'm not I'm certainly not a trace element expert, so we'll just see how we go, Rhiannon. Uh, yeah, there's a question from Roger around what soil test or analyte is used for Molly. Yeah, I don't know. So Roger's wanting to know what what is the soil test? Yeah. Yeah, OK, don't know. I'll have to look up. I'll have to go and find that out, Roger. I think I think that's what you're asking, Roger. Put your mic on and um, let me know if I've not got that right. Um, oh, and there's the, uh, Judy's asked a question about the desired level of Molly. Um, APAL doesn't give one. Ours are reading as 1.2 to 2.1 milligrams per kilogram. Yeah, I'd ha I'll have to go and check that as well. Um, sorry. Yeah, that's all right. Um, that was it. We've got another question on salinity, but I think we'll um, we'll when we get to the questions towards the end, I think we'll we'll address that one. Thanks, Alfie. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, so just uh, before we go on to picking up some of the questions from last time, I'll just summarise um, the three sessions that we've been running, um, steps to produce a healthy soil. Um, my advice is to, um, if you're wondering where to start, um, then maybe starting with your most productive paddock first. The reason for that um, is that you probably won't need to do um, very much. There might be just a few tweaks on your most productive paddock. Uh, so it might be a little bit of lime or it could be a little bit more phosphorus um, on your most productive paddock and then it really uh, will zing off. And once you've got that really humming, then you've got um, some good income coming in from that paddock and you can begin to address some of your other paddocks, which may have more than just one issue. So they, um, there's multiple issues that may be affecting production. So that's sort of the philosophy behind that. Um, if that appeals to you, then that, that would be my advice. 
and my sense of your order of tasks are really to address your major nutrient issues. Things like phosphorus, as we said last week, are a real driver of um, productivity. So you really need to be addressing phosphorus um, well before you start worrying about some of the other things. You also need to address your soil acidity issues. So um, correcting um, pH and reducing aluminium uh, by using uh, lime uh, would be a good place to start if your soil is below all of those um, critical limits on pH or, or is above on the aluminium critical limit. And the third um, area that I think needs to be addressed is organic matter. So we know that organic matter um, can play a big role for you in improving soil physical condition, biological condition and chemical condition. So really focusing in on building things that you can do to build organic matter. And one of the main things you can do is really manage your grazing, that is keeping soil covered. So we know that um, if you're grazing uh, soils down to bare boards um, and paddocks are going bare, you will not be building organic matter. You will be losing organic matter and possibly losing soil uh, as well through erosion. So really um, thinking through your grazing management and how you can do more to increase organic matter inputs into that soil. And one of the things is really focusing on the rest period, allowing paddocks a bit more rest will um, increase the, the organic matter inputs through roots and so on. Uh, and the last one there of um, managing wet soils. Um, so I've, I think there were some questions that had come through on managing waterlogged conditions. Uh, so certainly reducing traffic when soils are wet, they are most vulnerable to compaction. So the much as you can do to keep stock off traffic, uh, vehicles off soil that is wet will do go a long way to reducing compaction and reducing the levels of waterlogging on those soils. Um, you, you may also want to check whether you need to apply gypsum uh, to some of these wet areas. But I think it's also about uh, sort of rethinking the, the wet as well. Uh, in some cases, we don't have silver bullets for everything that may be not quite right with your soil. And so we do need to start thinking about how we're going to manage our soil for what it is, um, rather than trying to uh, change it. Um, what can we do? What could we plant there that will be more tolerant of those wet conditions? All right, uh, so Rhiannon, I'm just going to pick up now on a couple of questions that um, had come through at, in the registration process, but also um, through the question process that I hadn't answered as yet. So there was a question on uh, microbiological tests. Um, and could I recommend um, a microbiological test? So there's just a few things I wanted to say here is that this is still very much an emerging area. There is a lot of research going on and there are a lot of tests that are available that researchers are doing, but they're not necessarily all available um, for farmers. Some of the difficulties that we've got at the moment is interpreting the data. Um, so yes, you might send your soil off and get a microbiological test. But what does that actually mean? Um, what do we understand um, from the measurements? There's not really very much work on establishing the target values um, for some of these tests. So how do we know whether this test is meaning the soil is healthy or unhealthy? Um, it's still very, very um, unclear. Uh, and there really are no target values from a soil biology point of view at this point. And the other difficulty is variability. Um, so there's often great variability uh, between uh, regions and soil types 
on what might be healthy, considered healthy or normal um, in one region uh, may not translate to other regions or other soil types as well. Uh, and some of the work that's come through in the DNA process, so instead of going, one, one of the microbiological tests that researchers are using is measuring the DNA of the soil. So rather than looking at, you know, how many bacterias I've got and how many funguses I've got and all those sort of things, they're just looking at the DNA markers for various functions of biology. So they're looking for nitrogen fixing markers, phosphorus solubilizing um, DNA markers and so on. And what that work has really revealed and, and, and throws up a lot of questions for us is that um, where they did paired sites of soils that had been cropped um, continuously under conventional cropping um, or, or um, you know, conventional cropping systems and so on, right next door to um, uh, an area that has had no, uh, that's still very natural um, or what you would call natural. So using um, sites that are cemeteries and so on where um, they've sampled soils or roadsides where there's been no cultivation or chemical sprays or anything like that. And what it's revealed is that um, while there are differences in, in what uh, DNA markers are switched on between those sites, um, what does that actually mean? It's just, it's just that they're different. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a good or there's a bad in all of this. It just means that they're different. So we're still at a very early stage of trying to understand and evaluate some of this testing. So I'm sorry, I haven't got a uh, definitive answer for that one. There was a question around testing for soil pathogens like verticillium wilt, and I can say, yes, we can do that. Uh, so SARDI, who are based in South Australia, do have a diagnostic uh, test for a whole range of soil pathogens, and you can um, send that through. It's um, their predictor B test, um, and so there's some contact uh, details there if you'd like to make the most of that. There was a question around what are the pros and cons of using organic versus inorganic fertiliser? So for um, organic forms of fertiliser, so these are things like uh, compost, manures, um, those sort of things, uh, worm casts, you know, various sprays and things like that. So from a from a pro point of view, uh, these are generally slow release um, forms of uh, nutrient. Um, so it can mean you reduce the likelihood of leaching, you reduce the likelihood of over applying, those sort of things. Um, Pro is that they often uh, include a range of other nutrients, including organic matter. So as well as putting nutrient on, you're putting on a whole lot of organic matter. So that's um, all a good thing. I've just put in brackets here that they can include impurities such as heavy metals. So you are, you are encouraged to ensure that you test or you get an analysis of whatever you decide to put on. Um, yeah, uh, cons. Um, so the slow release nature can mean that it takes longer to realise the results. And this is particularly the case if you are trying to sow a crop or sow a pasture and using organic only forms of fertiliser, um, then in those cases you can get a yield or plant growth check because um, those early stages of, of plant growth and root growth, they need a, a really strong burst of nutrient to jump out of the ground. Otherwise, 
Um, they come up slowly, they're weaker, they're less able to compete with uh, weeds and so on. Um, they have variable content um, of the nutrients, so you do need to, as I said, ask for an analysis of whatever you are buying. Um, and they generally contain lower concentrations of the nutrients, so you do generally have to apply larger volumes um, to get the right amount of nutrient on, and that's where then they often become more expensive uh, per unit of nutrient. For inorganic forms of fertiliser, so that's the standards of uh, superphosphates in all of its um, different forms and so on, the pros are that they can be quick release. Uh, so you can see faster response, so it is better for sowing crops and pastures. Uh, they have a higher nutrient content, so you don't have to be applying uh, quite as much and they're often in a form that is easier to spread. In terms of cons, um, quick release nature can mean a higher risk of leaching. This is particularly the case where you're putting on nitrogen for types of fertiliser, urea and so on. Um, they become, they are yeah, at risk of leaching and in the case of urea, also at risk of volatilisation, so losing it as a gas. Um, and there can be also heavy metal impurities um, in the fertiliser um, as well. So just taking note that we do have heavy metals in, at, in background levels in our soil as well. So um, they are there, but sometimes in the fertiliser there can be more. So um, I, the only other comment I wanted to make about this is that I think uh, what we are seeing, uh, what I was asked is pros and cons of using organic versus inorganic. What I'm seeing coming through some of the research literature is, is what I think to be quite exciting is um, a lot more research happening now about what if we put both on? What if we combine um, some organic forms of um, fertiliser with inorganic. And we're seeing some really interesting results there. Uh, so uh, it seems to be a lot of advantages um, by doing that. So in, in combining, then you don't need as much of your inorganic fertiliser, uh, but you're still putting you know, reasonable amounts of uh, nutrient on. Um, and where by using the organic forms, there seems to be some stimulation of root growth um, uh, and so better uptake, so a far better efficiency of use of the nutrient is occurring when we use both in, in a combination type arrangement. So. So I'm seeing in terms of where we're heading in agriculture is a lot less about, you know, I'm an organic farmer or no, I'm a conventional farmer. Um, and I think the future will be that we will meet in the middle um, as we recognise the benefits of both approaches. Um, agriculture will be probably somewhere in the middle uh, is what I'm reckoning. All right, so yeah, describing your soil, um, what sort of field indicators could you use to give you a sense of your soil type? So the first thing is um, you need to dig down. We've been talking about a naught to 10 centimetre sample, which is really um, just very much the surface soil. So I would encourage you to dig deeper if you can um, and assess these field indicators and how it changes with depth. So we're talking about soil colour, texture, um, soil structure and the structural stability and uh, pH. And I'll just also plug the Karangamite Regions Brown book, which um, also provides you with some guides on field indicators, such as the visual soil assessment guide, um, which gives you some guidance on how to look at your soil. So in terms of um, soil colour, which really gives you an indication of your drainage, 
Um, the soil colour relates to the minerals that are present and the organic matter, as well as the drainage characteristics of the soil. Iron is a common mineral that is present in soil and it influences uh, colour in that iron can exist in um, differing chemical states uh, depending on how much oxygen is around. So when we see whole red subsoils, this would be indicating good drainage because it means that that iron has rusted in the presence of the oxygen, so it's turned red. When we start to see um, mottling, uh, so grey, yellow or red flecks through the soil can indicate periodic waterlogging. When we see, uh, starting to see whole grey colours in the soil, um, then that can indicate that the waterlogging um, hangs around for a lot longer than just um, short, sharp periods. The other thing that would be useful for you to take a look at is um, the texture of your soil, which gives you an indication of the water and nutrient holding capacity because uh, field texture is based on a rough estimate of the percentage of clay. It's very much about how the soil feels as you manipulate it in your hand. Um, and uh, as you can imagine, with more clay, you'll be able to ribbon the soil out. So in the photo there, you can see someone ribboning the soil, so creating a ribbon. When you've got more clay, your ribbon length will be longer. Uh, so that's what how soil texture field texturing works. It gives you an estimate of the percentage of clay. And the reason why we're interested in the clay fraction is that it controls much of the physical and chemical properties of soil. And I've just talked about how the clay surfaces have a negative charge and that attracts ca uh, cations. And that is what gives the soil its cation exchange capacity. So by understanding whether you've got a clay soil, a sandy soil or a silty soil, it gives you an indication of um, your water and nutrient holding capacity. And in terms of soil structure, that's an indicator of the porosity of the soil. So we talked about um, crumbly bits. Um, so we're talking about these bits here on the soil, these are when the clay, sands and silts are bound together in aggregates or peds, these crumbly bits of soil, uh, and these are all wrapped up and um, kept bound together by fine plant roots, fungal hyphae and bacteria. Uh, so when you've got soil like this, you can see plenty of holes and cracks for water to go through and for air um, to circulate through. When you have hard setting soils, um, you don't have much crumbly bits there. It's very hard to see how water is going to drain, particularly if you get a big downpour. It's going to disappear and drain through this soil very quickly. It's going to sit on top of this soil before it finds all these tiny, tiny little cracks to get through. So soil structure then gives you an indication of your soil's porosity. And we also talked earlier about um, the stability of that soil. And so just having a little aggregate, plopping it into a dish of distilled water or rainwater and watching what happens um, over a 24 hour period. And if you can do that, um, down through the profile, so take some surface soil a little bit further down and then down into the subsoil and watch what happens. Uh, it can be quite informative about your soil structure. And the last one is pH. You've all got a soil test pH uh, sitting in front of you. Uh, this is a rough and ready indicator of pH. These kits were originally developed by uh, CSIRO they are designed to estimate pH in one in the one to five soil to water uh, extract. Um, 
and they have uh, an error margin of plus or minus half a pH unit. Now, we've already talked about the fact that pHs are on a logarithmic scale, which means the difference between a pH of 5 and a pH of 6 is tenfold, which is quite a bit when we're talking about soil chemistry. So an error margin of plus or minus half a pH unit is quite big. So you wouldn't be using these to um, decide on a liming program, for example. Uh, but what it can do is give you an opportunity to test all of your property and down to the uh, greater depth. So check what your pH is at depth um, and you'll get more of an indication so where you've got quite acid pHs in using this test kit, you might want to get them properly tested in the laboratory. Uh, so Rhiannon, that, that was all I was really going to say on soil types. Um, so by using your texture, your structure, your colour and your pH, it gives you a good um, starting point to understand your soil type. Was there anything else you thought I needed to say, Rhiannon? You're on mute. It's the best way to listen to me. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's a that's a good uh, overview. If um, people have more questions on how to interpret some of that stuff or relating it back to the soil test or management, um, then please feel free to pop those um, in the chat box. If you have issues with chat and stuff, um, you can use a little hand indicator as well and um, we can get your microphone uh, on. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess the other thing to say, Rhiannon, is that um, there are some common soil types in the booklet. Um, starting on page 43 with some nice clear photos there and some descriptors of those soil types. So once you've done your description as I've just outlined here, you'll be able to go to that uh, those pages and try and match up your soil as best you can to those soil types. So that might be where we can leave that one. Yeah. Uh, all right, so uh, these were questions from the last session that I, I didn't wasn't able to answer or I didn't answer very well. So there was a question around um, someone saying that their PBI had been adjusted. It says on the soil test that it had been adjusted. So thanks for that question. Um, I wasn't unaware, but apparently those soil sorption PBI measures um, can be adjusted in the laboratory and they're adjusting them for the effect of the current phosphorus fertility on the amount of P a soil can sorb. Um, however, my reading of it seems that there, there really are only minimal changes in the PBI when it is adjusted for the current um, fertility. But in general, um, where if you've got a reasonably high level of current P fertility, then your PBI um, could be lower as measured, could, could be reported as lower than what it really is. So that's what they're trying to um, get around. Interestingly, also I found that uh, this piece of information here that um, the application of lime can significantly increase the level of PBI that would be measured. So they are suggesting that you don't get your PBI measurement if you've just limed. So all of this comes from this paper um, uh, published in 2008 in the Australian Journal of Soil Research by Lucy Burkett, Peter Sale and Cameron Gooley, all eminent soil scientists. So that, that was an interesting one. 
Uh, and there was the question from the last session about um, how, what is the percentage of sulphur in gypsum? And someone on the chat answered the question and answered it very well. I think they said um, it was about 18 or 19 per cent, uh, which is exactly right. So pure gypsum, calcium sulphate, contains around 18.6 um, per cent um, sulphur. However, uh, as I said before, we are now using naturally occurring gypsum, um, which varies in content uh, between 35 and 85% gypsum. And similar to lime, there are now different grades of gypsum, uh, which will vary in their sulphur content. So I've, I've put that all there for you. Um, so grade one having the most amount of sulphur down to grade three having the least amount. And I imagine, I haven't looked this up, but I imagine that's what will also affect uh, your costs of gypsum. And there was a follow up question there on can you be, can you apply too much gypsum and um, what is the impact? So my answer to that is that if you are applying um, what would be considered typical rates, so one to two and a half tonnes per hectare, um, I think you you are fine. Um, putting more on, um, there's a couple of things that you just need to be aware of is that gypsum is a salt. So it's um, you're actually adding a salt into the soil. Um, so you, so that's going back to those comments before is that I, I don't th see gypsum as a thing that you should be applying um, every year. It's more of a tactical approach to manage those soils that are dispersive when you are needing to sow something. And um, if you are sowing something into a dispersive soil, uh, it can lead to some pretty poor uh, emergence outcomes because that soil, if it gets wet, um, may tend to um, waterlog that seed uh, or crust that seed so that it doesn't emerge. So um, gypsum is then a tactical measure um, to be used uh, on dispersive soils. The other impact of gypsum is that it can be um, slightly acidifying as well. So if you're in the typical rate area, there should be no problem. Um, and if you're using it tactically, again, should be no problem. Some more questions from the last session. Um, my, there was a soil test that was in the chat um, box coming through. There was someone saying that their soil test interpretation was giving them a higher target level for sulphur. Why might that be? Um, so just in putting in there that target levels for sulphur are higher for vegetables. So um, if you had indicated that you were growing uh, vegetables or for it was for a home garden, that might be why you've got a higher target levels. Um, and also may also be suggested for hay paddocks um, because you're taking a lot more nutrient out. So there were some uh, additional thoughts for you to consider as to why you might be given a higher target level. Um, our tests show high iron and I understand that excess um, that that can tie up um, phosphorus, what is our best option? So this goes back to that PBI, um, phosphorus buffering index. So soils with um, high iron oxides, high aluminium oxides can tend to tie up phosphorus and so your PBI will be higher. And so what that will mean is that your target level for phosphorus will be a lot higher than for someone else who um, has a lower PBI, they, um, then their target level 
will be lower. So your best option then is to um, assume that you will need to be applying more phosphorus because you know that some of the phosphorus you apply will be immediately tied up by the soil and not available to the plant. So that's just one of the issues with that particular soil type um, that you've got higher target levels for your P. Uh, lime question, can you apply too much? Would lower dressings be better over multiple years than a larger amount in one year? So again, um, the typical rates that you might be recommended to apply lime of, you know, one to two to two and a half lime, uh, tons of per hectare of lime are fine. Um, but if you are in a situation where you are very acidic or very, have very high aluminium and you are having to put on um, a lot more lime, um, then you might want to consider doing that in a number of um, some multiple dressings. In saying that though, there will certainly be a difference of opinion between advisors. So um, the farm economists will be saying, just get it on, just stick it on, um, putting it over, applying it in smaller dressings over multiple years will just cost you more because you're paying for multiple applications. Um, so each time you apply the lime, you have to pay to um, get it out. So it's going to cost you more um, than if you just stick it on. Um, so that's one of the things you've got to weigh up is, is the you're increasing your costs. Um, our soil tests indicate that organic carbon of 5% is excessive. Um, are there negative consequences? Well, first of all, I'm not sure that I would describe organic carbon at, at, of 5% as excessive. Um, but yes, there, there can be some negative consequences of high levels of organic carbon. And that is that within the organic matter, there are weak uh, organic acids. So in um, where we're getting a lot of organic matter accumulating, the soil can um, acidify through the action of those weak organic acids. However, I would emphasise the fact that they are weak. So that means um, they are weak at changing the pH of the soil. So although they are acids, um, they're not going to have a big or immediate effect on, on pH. They are a weak acid. All right, um, so I'll just go back to that. Um, so Rhiannon, before I start wrapping up, it might be a good opportunity to see if there are some further questions that have come forward. Uh, yeah, thanks, Kath. Um, Alfred's made a comment that salinity fixes sodicity um, dispersion issues. Uh, that's why saline soils often don't seem to waterlog, um, and this is very confusing for a lot of people. Um, Alfred, I wasn't sure if you had a particular question um, in relation to that, if you want to turn on your mic or um, add it in the chat box. Um, Kath, I don't know, um, salinity and sodicity can um, confuse people. Is yeah. There any comments on that? Yeah, well, uh, saline soils are often very well structured and uh, if, if you use slightly saline uh, irrigation water, it penetrates a lot better in the soil than, uh, than very fresh rainwater. So there is an, uh, a very complicated interaction between salinity and sodicity that a lot of people, including me from time to time, get confused by. And we haven't talked much about salinity in this course, but and, and salinity actually has uh, decreased uh, the last 10, 20 years, 40 years, 30 years ago. It was a big issue, but it becomes 
less of an issue is the drying climate and water tables going down. So yeah. I don't know. It's just thrown in as a comment. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Alfred. Thanks, Alfred. And yes, you are um, very quite quite right. So where um, sodicity is occurring, so excess um, sodium, uh, it is um, often a, accompanied by um, salinity and in those cases, um, as particularly as Alfred is saying, if you are irrigating with weak, uh, weak saline soil uh, water, um, you can keep those pores open um, so the soil is less um, vulnerable to dispersion. However, um, if you get, you know, excessive rainfall, fresh fresh water on those soils, um, they can disperse and then become quite difficult to to manage in that particular situation. Um, that being said, so so it is typical for in uh, saline situations for soils to be sodic. But it's not necessarily true um, that all sodic soils um, have salinity issues either. So as, as Alfred is point, rightly pointing out, it is quite a confusing and complex area, uh, which I haven't touched on, but it is in the book, um, some, some chapters there on soil uh, salinity and its relationship to sodicity. Was there something else, Rhiannon? Um, yeah, if I can just ask people, um, if you want to ask a question um, with the mic, um, either pop up your hand or just note in the chat box that you want to ask a question and while you just get that organised. Um, otherwise, we'll, we'll take it as there's not further questions. Um, Neil has asked, um, do we have any boron problems in northeast Victoria? Uh, thanks, Neil, and not to my knowledge. Um, boron becomes more of an issue in alkaline soils. So um, as we go further west, uh, so in Western Victoria, uh, we can get into boron um, uh, issues over there, but less so here, unless somebody else has got um, some information on that, that would be what I'm going to go with. Uh, thanks, Kath. And um, another one from Alfred regarding nitrous oxide considerations of using inorganic fertilisers and their impact on global warming. So I suppose that's around the, um, the efficiency of use of, of those fertilisers. Yeah, sorry, Ryan, can you just say the first part of that again? I just missed that. Uh, Alfred was asking about the nitrous oxide considerations of using inorganic fertilisers. Mm. Um, and so, and, uh, and yes. what their impacts on global warming. Um, I'm, I'm framing the question uh, for Alfred and so probably getting it wrong, but um, assuming that's around the efficiency of use of those types of fertilizers. Yes, that's correct. And it's got a bit of uh, uh, discussion in the news the last couple of years, I suppose, that uh, inefficient, use, inefficient use of waste of fertilizer has got a big, uh, they're very, uh, those nitrous oxides are very efficient in uh, causing uh, global warming. So if we use yes. them inefficiently, they go up in the atmosphere and cause problems. Yes, thanks, Alfred. And yes, that's very true. And in some of those animations that I encourage you, um, everyone to have a look at that were published by um, the Department on Victorian Resources Online, you can see the volatilization that can occur with the application of nitrous nitrogen based fertilizers um, so we can lose them uh, into the atmosphere as um, gas and that is a high greenhouse gas so it is a big issue and there is a fair amount of research particularly in the vegetable growing industry because they are 
using nitrogen um, more frequently and in higher amounts in the in the not in the vegetable growing industry, uh, looking at how they can reduce that loss. Uh, good point, Alfred. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Kath. And one more from Jonathan. Um, you spoke earlier about the aluminium test which is measured using calcium chloride. My test has aluminium using KCL. Is there much of a difference in the results? KCL. Um, I haven't got that one in my head. Let me just have a quick. Uh, yes, so for aluminium levels measured using the KCL method, um, you're looking for less than 50 milligrams per kilogram. That's on page 34 of the book. Yep, and it's also um, summary page um, six in Roman Thank you. <laughs> at the front. <laughs> Thanks, Rhiannon. About that. Um, that's all for the questions, um, Kath. So, yeah, ready to roll on. Okay, thanks, Rhiannon. And so I'll just start the wrap up then. Um, so just re-emphasising uh, that soil tests are only one piece of the puzzle. As you can see, I'm, I'm not able to answer all your soil test um, questions. Um, they're not 100% of the story. Um, your goals, your paddock condition, and the soil type are also critical parts that to bring to the table. So I guess what I'm really encouraging you to do is um, is using this method, using the uh, booklet, using the the knowledge that we've been talking about here today, in getting that conversation with your advisor, um, and hopefully asking some some questions of them, pushing them a bit harder um, in in your questioning. Uh, not necessarily feeling as though you need to be the expert, but making sure that you make really clear your goals uh, in this process of interpreting your soil test. And I really want to encourage you to on a regular sampling regime. So uh, interpreting a one-off soil test is, is quite difficult because we don't know whether it's indicating the number is going up or the number is going down. But once you start to get uh, a number of soil tests in front of you from the same paddock, uh, it becomes a lot easier to understand what might be happening in that particular situation. So really encouraging you to keep going with your soil testing. Uh, between every three to five years would be a good interval um, in pasture situations uh, to continue getting your soil tested. So that's that's it, Rhiannon. Thanks, Kath. Um, <laughs> can I just yeah take this opportunity uh, once again to thank you for um, a thoughtful and um, thorough presentation and series. Um, you've had a bit of homework <laughs> after Monday's session to, to go and look up. So uh, we appreciate um, being able to ask those questions. Um, and thank you for your time. Um, to the participants, um, we are recording this, so we will send um, a copy of the link to you um, as well as a survey link. Um, I've also popped that in the chat box. Um, if you can uh, fill that out, that's really um, helpful for us. Um, the other thing with the survey um, is to please feel free to add any follow up or things that um, you think we need to delve into further um, or go through again or just contact um, me directly with that. Um, so um, I think that's everything. We hope you've enjoyed um, and found valuable information from this series. Um, Kath's got her hand up. <laughs> no, you can't Sorry. ask questions. <laughs> Sorry, Anna, and I was just going to say one more thing. I think it was in answer to Judy's question about what's the critical limit for molybdenum. And I've just had a quick flick through the book, and it is in the book on page 41. Um, there's a 
Oh no, oh, it's a total content. Oh, sorry, I may have misinterpreted that. Sorry. Well, that was going to make me giggle with um, the author and the editor <laughs> asking about um, the book. So, <laughs> what's in the book? Yeah. yeah, I will take it on as homework and try and work that out for Judy. Yeah, and maybe I, I did it. actually check. Oh, you didn't, Judy. Sorry, um, I did check before I chatted to put the question in chat. <laughs> <laughs> of course you did, Judy. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so, and just with respect to the series and the workshops, um, thank you for um, to Judy for instigating them with the Yay River Catchment Land Care Group and working together with Kath and um, me to um, make it happen. So, uh, we will see you all another time and um, say bye for today. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Rihanna. And bye. Bye.